Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob McSherry. I'd like to say I consider it a distinct privilege and honor to be here this morning to share with you the history behind the items my grandfather and great uncle brought back from World War I, in which my family and I have donated to the history department here at Madison. The story begins with my great uncle, Donald Patterson. Don wasn't a large man. Perhaps one of the young ladies here might help me demonstrate this by putting on his uniform coat. Uh, oh. Okay, well, or, yeah. Yeah, snug, snug fit, snug fit. And he was 22 when he wore this in the United States Army in 1918. This wouldn't have been what he wore in combat, but this was his dress uniform coat. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In 1915, Don left the University of Iowa School of Engineering and at his own expense went to France and volunteered to join the French Army. I don't know why. His motivation remains unknown, but it's safe to say he was warmly greeted by the French. They had already uh, welcomed a group of American aviators who formed a unit called the Lafayette Escadrille. Don was probably a member of the French Foreign Legion. There's a good chance that he, like hundreds of other Americans in the Legion, transferred to the 170th Line Infantry Regiment in 1916. The 170th were elite shock troops. They considered themselves the tip of the spear. Their nickname was the Swallows of Death. What I do know is that at some point, Don fought in the Battle of Verdun. The Battle of Verdun was arguably the worst battle in human history. It lasted from February 21st, 1916, to early December of that same year. During those nine and a half months, the German and French armies hammered away at each other. The German general staff specifically chose Verdun because of its symbolic and historical significance to the French. They knew the French would fight to the death to defend it. Their plan was to bleed the French army white using unprecedented masses of heavy artillery. And as predicted, the French fought with incredible valor. During the course of the battle, at least 275,000 French soldiers died, with at least that same number wounded. The German army suffered nearly as badly, losing 217,000 dead and nearly 200,000 wounded. The minimum number of dead is 492,000, with close to a half a million wounded. The highest estimates range up to a combined number of 700,000 dead and nearly that many wounded. So great were the numbers that after the battle, tens of thousands of mangled corpses and parts of bodies were entombed in mass graves called ne necrotoriums. There are dozens of these sites in and around Verdun. It's difficult to picture what numbers that large mean until they are converted from statistics to flesh and blood humans. Imagine packing a thousand people into the gym here at Madison, and then imagine doing that for every day for nearly two years. Veterans who survived this horror described it as the living embodiment of hell on earth. Non-stop bombardment by some of the largest artillery pieces ever used in war. Flamethrowers, poison gas. It is hard for us in this pleasant, peaceful setting to imagine what it was like. Because of the tremendous artillery bombardment, troops could only be brought up during the night. From 20 miles away, the new units could see the eastern horizon lit up by what must have seemed fiendish lightning. At 10 miles out, they could hear what sounded like thunder, and it must have grown more ominous with each forward step. When they stopped, they could feel the earth tremble beneath their feet. From three miles away, 
Further, if the wind was blowing in their direction, they could smell the front, and it's not difficult to imagine what it must have smelt like. Nearly a million men were crammed into an area of five square miles. The sanitary facilities, the latrines, where they existed at all were primitive. And remember, there were tens of thousands of unattended corpses baking in the sun. Any movement during the day drew immediate fire and was basically suicide. It was largely impossible to bury the dead. Those buried today would be unburied tonight by the artillery bombardment. There were no ceasefires. There were no truces to re recover the dead or the to retrieve the wounded. Every attack was usually followed almost immediately by a counterattack. The wounded were more often than not helplessly caught in succeeding battles. If you were paralyzed by your wounds and separated from your unit, there was a good chance you would be eaten alive by rats. If you were able to make it back to your own lines, it would probably be a day before you would receive treatment at a field hospital by its overwhelmed and exhausted staff. The seriously wounded would often spend a week waiting to be evacuated from the battle. The French positions were surrounded on three sides and were connected to the rear by one single long exposed road and railroad system that was under constant bombardment. Adjoining every field hospital were large deep pits that were filled with amputated arms and legs and then covered with quicklime. As spring became summer, the increasing heat would have made the stench more overwhelming with each passing day. In photos from the battle, you often see the soldiers with a handkerchief or some sort of rag in front of their face that they would have poured cologne or cognac or wine on anything to defeat that smell. Perhaps worst of all for the new troops was the lost look of horror etched into the faces of the men they were relieving and the knowledge that they would look just like that in a few weeks, if they were lucky. These were the conditions in which the troops on both sides lived and fought, surrounded by the dead. Bodies in varying stages of decomposition would have been their dining and sleeping companions. The battlefield soon became overrun with an army of rats who became obscenely obese as a result of the endless buffet of dead.